is, can I fix my background? Okay. Nope. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. Hello, it's John Davis, Davis Business Coaching. And I'm here with John, and I should have gotten it. John Quattrochi. Did I say that right? Quattrochi. Quattrochi. Um, and John's going to fill us in about his business. Uh, he's a, a CPA and, and does financial services uh, just uh, north of Atlanta. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, John, I'll just you know, give you a chance to just introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about your company. Great. Thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity. Hey, listen, I'm, um, I'm a CPA and we work with business owners uh, of varying sizes and varying descriptions. You know, we have a, a couple of key uh, key verticals that we like to use. Um, we do bookkeeping, accounting, and taxes and payroll and things you would expect from most uh, most accountants. Above and beyond that, we like to feel like we add financial sophistication to a business operation. One of the things we've learned over the years that a lot of people start off, they have nothing to lose, so they want to do minimum, 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 right? We want to pay minimum insurance. And I say, well, now you're a grown-up big boy company. Maybe you should be thinking about, instead of minimum insurance coverage, maximizing your coverage against exposure right? Because you do have something to lose now. And maybe you don't need to continue to hire the cheapest employees or the least this, least that. And you need to work on the quality of life side of your business as well as your just pure, pure financial side. Okay. So you're helping them make decisions that are, are not obvious, it sounds like. You know, many, many just, you know, if you don't understand it, you're working on price. If you understand what the value is and what the difference is, you're you're willing to invest more to to protect your well, business I, and guide it. Is that about right? I mean, I, yeah, I'll give you a, an interesting example. Um, I was in Florida on vacation with my family, and we got rear-ended by this guy. Uh, totaled my car. He had just sold his business and retired to Florida. Bought a brand new house on the beach and a brand new car. And he had $25,000 as a minimum coverage. Uh, you know, you know did, did he realize how close he came to losing everything? <laughs> right. You know, fortunately, he hit the right guy. And I still regret it, but I didn't sue him. Um, <laughs> I could have had his beach house, right? I'm very easy, right? right? And so, again minimum minimum rather than understanding your your exposure and that's just on the insurance side right so how long have you been doing this i've been doing it let's see i got out of school in 1982 and i became certified in 85. okay all right so a lot of experience a little too long <laughs> <laughs> so who's your best customer Uh, if if somebody is like me and they've been in business for a long time, well, not like me, but you know they're in and they're in a very comfortable space and they're not looking to grow, they're not looking to expand, and they're just looking to continue to tread water. They're probably a bad customer for me. A good customer is somebody that's interested in growing, maybe getting from one location to two or five or more or from five to 10, or interested in possibly franchising their, their concept, or also somebody that's looking to um, monetize the business and retire, right? So what we need to do is we start from ideas, we go to uh, implementation, then you know tax planning is euphemized by saying success planning, right? Right. So we'll put in, things to lower their taxes, maybe we'll put in some retirement plans, maybe we'll put in some non-taxable benefits, et cetera, et cetera. And then the fourth stage is what we call legacy building, um, which includes making sure that that business is successful enough so that when you sell it, you have enough money for retirement and to build a financial legacy for your family. One of, one of the funniest stories I had is I had a guy that he owned a couple of fast food places and he used that money to pay his daughter's way through college and medical school. When she graduated, she sold a, he sold those two businesses 
I bought a medical practice. So I, I just often wondered if the people that walked in to get treated medically understood that that business used to be a Dairy Queen or whatever it was. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I again, spoke to somebody like yesterday. Building. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, was, I spoke to somebody yesterday. She does mergers and acquisitions. And we talked about all the tax implications of buying and selling. And if, you, if you're not prepared well in advance and you don't have good professional advice, you could be losing hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table, if not millions. Right, we can see it. And, you know, and, you know there, there are some instances of unreported income. And, you know, if you don't report that income, you're gonna, not going to get that sales multiple on that at the end of the year. You know, obviously, we, we, we don't have any existing clients that don't report their income. But, you know, you see businesses for sale all the time and the price is outrageous compared to what they're showing as income. Right. And, you know, that that's something that's very concerning. Mm -hmm. OK, so a big a big topic right now. And I'm going to go back to, you know, 2019. Let's just go back two three years. Not not just the COVID thing, but you everything like that's happened. 2020 and 2021 didn't happen. <laughs> well, no, I want to talk about them, but but I don't want to just narrow it down to COVID. It's no, it's I, all I, the I things that happened with it, right? Supply chain staffing. Now, you know, the, the talk of what are we in a recession, things of that nature. So all the change that's happened in the last few years has created a lot of opportunities and challenges for business owners. So uh, and there's always business owners always deal with opportunities and challenges every day. But the last few years have just been a little bit nuts. So what have you done within your business as a result of how our business environments changed the last few years? There are a lot of questions and there's one answer. You know, when taxes go up, individual business owners have to work a little harder to make their money. When inflation occurs, we have to work a little harder to make a little to make more money. You know, when business is in a recession and things are slowing down a little bit, we just have to gear up and work a little bit harder. So no matter what circumstances we have and what circumstances we run, the solution always is, you know, we got to dig down, work a little harder, and push a little harder and whatever challenges we are. And I like to say that, you know, there are some businesses that are too big to fail. Most of us small business owners are not among that group. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's for sure. Um, well, you know, I mean, you see all the time, you know, where you might have a gas station or a fast food place and the government comes in and puts a median in the road, you know, without thinking twice about it. And boom, your business is cut in half. Yeah, it's going on right down the road. I just saw they have a road that's been under construction for a couple of months. And I was wondering about all the businesses on that road. It just it cut yeah, their traffic. Making, making laughs and making laughs, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, I, like I like that approach. You know, no matter what comes, you have to work a little bit harder. Um, obviously, when you hear about when you hear the concept work harder, you're thinking work smarter, right? You know, so you have to be very selective about where you work harder. Um, but I still agree with it, right? A business owner's mm -hmm. got to. What, whatever it is, you got to dig in and and tackle the challenge. It's not well, going to just go. We learn, yeah, we got to learn that we can't help everybody, right? There are some people whose business is too small. They're not going anywhere. They're not doing anything. You know, we can't really help those guys, right? You know, if, if, if you have a jewelry store, for example, you are aware of the fact that not everybody that walks in is a good candidate for buying your jewelry, right? You have right. a Mercedes dealership. Um, you know, there's certain people that aren't going to qualify. You know, I was um, I was at the dealership and I was buying my car, and um, somebody called my my salesman while I was in his office, and he said um, he wanted to a hundred if they he was asking if they would hundred percent finance a hundred and ten thousand dollar Escalade. <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean you have no money to put down but you expect that they're going to sell you especially when there was no inventory right right um so and they said well you're going to need some somewhat of a down payment and um you know the guy on the other end must have said how much 
at my sales and said, oh, about $110,000 down payment would cover it. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So I guess, they're, I guess they're used to getting calls like that. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. So are there any things that you wish you had done differently in the last few years? You know, with hindsight, you know, hindsight's 2020 type thing. Well, you know, and and I hate to disagree with you, but I, I, I like to say that hindsight is 2020. It's the worst lie in business. I think a lot of people and too many people tend to make the same mistake over and over and over, and they fall back into the same bad habits sometimes. True. My I agree with that. Says, he said hindsight is 50-50. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, we all have regrets and things we had wished we had done. And if we had gotten in sooner, maybe we could have anticipated this, this rollback a little bit and, and what readjustments we, we could have made. You know, you look at some of the businesses and the fantastic job that they've, adjust, uh, they've adapted on the fly in their business. I mean, in Dunkin' Donuts, um, they always have... Um, they always had some trouble with the drive through Their drive through obviously not as popular as some of the other coffee places. But over the last three years, people have learned that that might be the best way to do it. And now Duncan is, is opening drive through only locations. So they, they have taught their customers to readjust. And the job that, for example, Chick-fil-A has done with the way they're managing their drive through windows now. And it looks like a NASCAR event because they're like triple wide in their drive through um, yep. And these are all adjustments that we made. Yeah, if we knew where we were going to do, you know, they told us in March of 2020, all right, we're just going to shut the world down for two weeks and then we're going to be back to normal starting April 1st. You know, it's interesting the how people i was thinking about this the other day that people are accepting a 20 minute wait in the drive through now um right. other than chick-fil-a now you're right. still getting like a 10 minute wait there but you can tell that they've really expanded capacity so people tolerate it um right but it is interesting how our norms have changed um no I for sure how quickly it changed but then again, if you are working and you're on your phone and you're talking on the phone, it doesn't matter whether you're stuck in traffic or stuck in a line at a drive through <laughs> Right. Um, and a lot of people will, will do that in the morning. So are there any changes that you've made to your business that you're going to, in the last three years, they're going to stay a permanent part of your business? Like this drive through right? That's, that's a permanent part of many businesses now. Uh, for right. Chick-fil-A, for sure. What 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 about your business has has changed? It's going to stay permanent. Well, you know, we we have learned over the years that you being in Grayson might be a better client than the guy in the building right next door. For example, hmm. he makes an appointment to come in Tuesday, and then he moves it, and he changes it, and he re if. I know I have a Zoom call or whatever with you, whether you're out of town or, or across town, then there's a little bit more force discipline that goes into, into that equation. And sometimes it's better to be a little bit remote so we have a little bit more structure so we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I think I schedule differently now. Um, I had a situation go on in my... Uh, in my rotary uh, that I work in. And we talked about having a meeting. And I said, okay, well, we can get together next week face to face, or I can get together tomorrow by Zoom. Mm -hmm. Right. And because you can do Zoom and because it's a little bit more efficient, um, you can you can work faster for certain. Um, faster, lower cost. And and you're right, it does open your your market. It opens the area of your market because of Zoom. And, and remote. And, and like I said, it, and it's also a factor what people are used to, right? You know, I had a guy, he owned a bar in Atlanta and he passed away several years ago. And he, he used to say, John, you know, a thousand people come into my pub every week to tell me their problems. Once a week, I pack up my car and drive over here and tell you mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And, 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 uh, well, and it, it's true too. And you know some of those some of those guys and i guess that's 
sort of part of the COVID thing. We have we've lost a lot of people um, for whatever reasons. Um, and I don't know if it's a function of clients getting older or whatever, but it seems like I've had a, a lot of clients pass away in the past few years, couple of years. Um, but then again, that leads me back to the whole business succession planning and monetizing doing that. You know, in the past, you know, doctors used to be Dr. Smith, MD, right? But they changed their name to, you know, North Fulton, this or that, right? And one of the reasons you want to do it is you want to make it more of a sellable product. Right. And make it to where you're dealing with this practice, not with this individual doctor. And getting back to what um, the real estate agent I was speaking with um, last week, we are trying to brand her. So it's not necessarily her that you need to talk to. To so then she's got a sellable, scalable business and, yep. and build a legacy, right? Nobody goes to a uh, a Burger King because this particular guy owns that one, right? Yep. Its, it's brand speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I've, I've worked with that with a lot of people that are working to build that brand, um, and then also you're seeing that branding happen within certain franchises, you talked about the realtor, so that they yeah. they can maintain their brand, but have a separate, they have, they're a little more uh, transportable. Uh, they can they can move from brand to brand, particularly in the realtor space, right? Yeah. The realtor can have their brand and they're under different flags or, or brokers. Um, that's important for, right. for well, a business then, like that. You know, yeah, you might need a more 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 hands-on broker to affiliate with when you begin, and then opposite, I guess, of what I said earlier, you will need them on an increasingly decreasing basis, right? Once you yep. have your your critical mass of experience, you don't need other people's help or assistance. Exactly. So um, along those lines, with experience, what's been your biggest learning since you've been a business owner? Right. If you could go back and to yourself in 1985, what would you tell yourself? I think more. I'd be more selective about some of the people that I would choose to be clients. Okay. And you know, sometimes I tell people it. You know, life is a. And I compare it to college football, right? If you're Vanderbilt, you're out there recruiting and recruiting and recruiting and trying to get people to come to your school. If you're Alabama, you're selecting. <laughs> right. Right. So this is this is the list of the 10 people we want. And, you know, they can easily get eight of those. Right. And, you know, Vanderbilt might have a list of 10 and they hope they can talk to four and maybe get two. Um, so if you transform your business from recruiting clients to selecting clients, you should be able to get the fees you deserve. And that's true of my business and probably true of any business. You know, because there's only so much you can get from, from you know, any, any type of client. So either you have to be big or planning on getting big. Yeah, that's great advice. I like the, the term selecting clients. Um, you know, we talk about, uh, I work with people on identifying their A customers. Right. And I think right. early on, people are more prone to work with not just B, but C and D customers that are actually holding them back. They think that they're helping them out in the short term as they're growing, but they're really they're, they're holding them back from that growth that they need. Well, you know, um, and I use that in, in, in when I talk to people about divorces, too. I say, you know, you clutch on to somebody like like you're in the middle of the ocean and you think you're a life preserver. And once you let go, you realize they were an anchor. Yeah, that, that's a, that's that's a good analogy. So, are uh, there any? Uh, I, I I'd make up a lot of cliches. <laughs> <laughs> well, they work, right? They're effective, right? Um, is there any? Are there any offers or opportunities that are going on in your business right now that people need to to know about? I, I think in 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 various manifestations of of my profession there are a lot of accountants that are order takers and i want to say they're more like cashiers of the grocery store 
and whatever information you have, they just scan it into the system and whatever pops up as the tax liability is the tax liability. Um, I would think if you think of uh, all the other opportunities you have, so it would be nice if, if you scanned in your ribeye steaks, they would, the cashier would say, time out, you need to get this bottle of uh, Pinot Noir to go with it, or right. you forgot your mushrooms or whatever, right? Um, and that's the way I like to think. The, the amount of tax credits that are available um, to the average business owner go way, way undetected. Um, you're talking about research and development tax credits that are mostly good in software business. The huge thing I'm working on now is the employee retention tax credit. So if you started a business or you had a decline in sales during COVID, you may be eligible for up to $25,000 a year in tax credits for every employee you kept during that period. Uh, that could be huge. Employee training credits are another one that we go out and, and we get. You know, if you buy a new point of sale system for your subway, and you spend 10 hours training people, those hours are not only deductible, but they become tax credits, which are much more valuable than deductions. And those things are all out there. Um, you know, like I alluded to earlier, we have, you know, um, things like retirement plans that we can put in. We also have ways of selling a business that might be tax uh, uh, advantageous. You know, if you decide you're going to sell your your business to, you know, for your key employees, maybe we could do an ESOP, which is the most tax advantageous way of selling yeah. your business. If you're looking to go and and change from from a, a, you know a a service franchise to a fast food franchise, we might be able to do a like kind exchange and pay no tax on the on the transfer of that business. Right. Um, and whether it's capital gains or ordinary income is another thing that has to be considered. They're all I mean, and those so, are, those are where big money can possibly come in. So the big thing is the big lesson then is you know if it comes down to managing your money and what you're trying to do with your your investments or your your income, you probably don't want to be spending cheap there. You want to be well, you want to make would, sure you're I talking would, to a professional who knows what they're doing. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I would, I would, I would agree with that statement, and you know, and and surrounding yourself to to further answer your question, surrounding yourself with other other professionals that can fill in all the gaps and give people complete, comprehensive coverage um, in what their needs and a, and their business affairs require. I think is a is a good answer too. And okay. You were talking about you know d d clients and i said you know i've worked with some big accounting firms before that tried to jettison their clients because they were d clients to them but they're b plus clients to me um just because of bandwidth overhead whatever you want to say right. so you 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 can even think of a potential competitor as really an ally under the right circumstance Absolutely. Well, they probably don't want to have my clients anyway. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, that's a lot of good information. I really do appreciate the time here. Um, so uh, is there any last things you want to share with everyone, John? Well, you know, I guess I guess probably have to throw out this disclaimer that said, you know, any any tax advice has to be, you know, analyzed given your specific circumstance or whatever. And don't go out and do crazy things because you heard it here. <laughs> get a get a <laughs> get a real professional to review it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, awesome. Mm -hmm. well, John. Okay. I really appreciate it. It was great talking to you. You too. All right. Bye. Bye.